everybody. Uh, can you hear us all right? Yeah. Hello, hello, hello. Hello? Yeah, great. Okay. Can I just say a very warm welcome to you all uh, on behalf of the Career Service to First Tuesday Club. And I'm very sad to say this is actually our last First Tuesday Club uh, of this series. But I would like to do a big shout out to Edrington. I think there's a table over here somewhere. Can we say a big thanks to Edrington, who's been a super sponsor of our series so far. So thank you. A couple of housekeeping points. If you have a mobile phone, could you put it to silent, please? And we're not expecting a fire alarm, but if there is one, uh, just make your way back down the stairs that you came, out, came up and uh, wait outside to the front of the building. Now, in our first, club, first Tuesday Club series, uh, we invite inspirational speakers to come and talk about their career journey. Uh, and we open it then to questions and answers for you for, for discussion. And today, I'd like to give a really warm welcome to Alice Thompson, who's here from Social Bite. Uh, many of you might know Alice from hitting the headlines recently. That was uh, certainly one of the, the ways I've seen her. Uh, through the Royal Visit and um, going to visit Social Bite in Edinburgh. But today, um, hopefully, we're going to, to find um, out more about Alice and the person behind Social Bite. So I feel a wee bit like Pierce Morgan saying this, but uh, it's going to be good to hear her story. Don't be as tough as Piers Morgan. <laughs> I'll try not to. Or as much of an asshole. <laughs> So, before we get on to asking questions, I thought it would be helpful just to give you a, an introduction to, to Alice and what I've been able to find out about her so far. So, as co-founder and director of Social Bite, today Alice is actually one of Scotland's leading entrepreneurs. After school, she went to Queen Margaret University to study event management, but two years later she left her course to join an events company on an unpaid internship, and she's never really looked back. She worked as an events coordinator for the first ever Scottish Business Awards and as an events manager for the Ski and Snowboard Show in Glasgow before going on to co-found Social Bite, uh, which is a social business sandwich shop chain in Glasgow, Edinburgh and Aberdeen. Now, in five years, Social Bite has gone from being one small shop with a staff of eight to eight units and 100 staff with one in four staff having experienced homelessness themselves. With a simple mission to give their profits away to charity, they employ, feed, and are now creating a village, especially for the homeless. This has been achieved while simultaneously running the Scottish Business Awards over a four year period, hosting speakers such as President Bill Clinton, George Clooney, Richard Branson, eh, and raising millions for charity. Today, in 2018, Social Bite is on a mission to end homelessness in Scotland using the Housing First model. Their aim is to fundraise on a national scale so that they can fulfil their vision of a Scotland where homelessness is no longer part of society. So that is some vision. I'm thoroughly impressed with your research. <laughs> That is like a brilliant two minute synopsis of the last six, seven years. <laughs> well, it was hard. It was hard, <laughs> let me tell you. Okay, so maybe just to get the ball rolling, I'll start to ask Alice um, a couple of questions and then we'll throw it open uh, to you because I'm sure you're sitting there with, with burning questions to ask her. But I thought actually if we went back, backtracked to 2011, because I know in 2011 you um, had a visit to Bangladesh, which I think from looking at your career path um, had a profound effect on your career, career course. So maybe if you could explain a little bit about that and tell us about that. Yeah, of course. So, um, so yeah, I was uh, part of this events company, um, which I should probably explain the events company was... Um, my business partner, Josh, he had just left Edinburgh Uni and he decided he wanted to set up an events company and he put an ad up on Gumtree for um, unpaid internships because he had no money to pay anybody. Um, and I rocked up for an interview thinking I was going to be working with this huge events company. Uh, it turned out it was Josh who was still trying to grow facial hair at the time. Um, and so, yeah, that was, so, so we decided, we came up, there was an event that we just called it the Scottish Business Awards and we thought people would think it was like the Scottish Business Awards, uh, and they did, and we just didn't correct them. <laughs> um, so for that event, the first ever one, um, we were sort of like young and idealistic and we wanted, um, 
we wanted to have a keynote speaker come to that event so that it would be quite a, it would suddenly change the tone of the event. It was 100% for charity. Um, so that was kind of feeding our soul a little bit by, um, by doing that. But we thought it would be cool to get all of Scotland's most elite rich businessmen in one room and then um, get them drunk and take their money from them and give it to charity. So uh, we were reading a book by a guy called Mohammed Yunus, who was Nobel, is a Nobel Peace Prize winner. Um, and he, he is based in Bangladesh, and, um, and we decided to travel to Bangladesh to meet with him to ask him to be the keynote speaker at this first event um, after six months of being on the phone asking if he would confirm and people telling us that they didn't know who we were and please stop phoning. Uh, we decided if we went to Bangladesh he might take us more seriously. So that's how we went to Bangladesh, that's why. And, um, and once we were there, on the other side of the planet, we realised um, we, we turned up in Mohammed Yunus's office and he went, oh, that's very interesting, and, uh, and what, what date is that? And I went, oh, it's February 16th or something like that. And he went, oh, yeah, I can't do that date. Um, so we're like, but we were in Bangladesh to get you. Um, so yeah, he was kind of, he was cool though, and he was like, I'll, I'll come and I'll do a different thing for you guys. If you put on a different event two weeks later, I'm in Europe, I'll come, I'll do it. But um, unfortunately, we'd already like, sent out all of the uh, information booklets to all of the uh, nominees uh, with Mohammed Yunus as the confirmed speaker, because at one point, someone in his office did say he was gonna do it, and we took that as the nod to print that he was the keynote speaker. So we were a bit panicked about what we were gonna do um, for the event, and we ended up having Bob Geldof fill that hole the first year. But, um, but he, he essentially, Mohammed Yunus said, you know, you're here now, you're in Bangladesh, you may as well travel around for the next five days that you're here and see the projects. Um, so we travelled out to rural Bangladesh, like our end of nowhere, uh, five hours down a bumpy road, Josh throwing up outside of the car every ten minutes. And, um, and then we got so far out that, um, that a lot of the population of this town called Tarakandi had never seen white people before. Um, and they were fascinated by my skin and they were asking me if it was true that I get burnt in the sun. And um, So it was this like, whoa, like wow, uh, experience and on top of that experience being so incredible as it was it was uh, it was married with the fact that we were visiting social businesses that were designed by Mohammed Yunus this Nobel Peace Prize winner which were completely changing the face of poverty in rural Bangladesh um, in that it was eradicating it <laughs> um, so that was that was the trip that that night before we got our flight back we went let's sell the events business, as in the event that we, the separate event, which was a different one, which is at the SECC actually, um, that was, ski, ski yeah, exactly, the Glasgow, the, the, the Scotland Ski and Snowboard Show, we sold that and uh, put every penny into opening the first shop, decided to do something different. Great, and that's where it all started. And that's where it all started. Sure. Now, can I open the questions to the floor? Does anybody have anything that we would, oh, there we go, straight away, yeah? Would you like to ask? Ask Alice a question. Yeah. Um, so, an incredible story. I mean, just wow. It's very inspirational. So, thank you for sharing. Um, so, you've given a very high level overview of how you did that, and it's, it sounds like so much fun. Uh, if I may ask, uh, how did you finance that time in your life? Because you, if I understood it correctly, it was the second year of uni um, when you were doing that. But, how did you fund? The setting up of the event business. Yeah, I love answering this question. I feel like I answer this question all the time and I never get bored of it. Um, I, and I was actually, we were just having a chat about this as well. Um, so, uh, how, so, how to go, well, I guess I'll just be honest. We, Josh's dad uh, is a sort of successful restaurateur and he had uh, put down a deposit on a flat for Josh in Edinburgh and Josh was paying the mortgage for that flat every month. That was the idea and uh, the mortgage just didn't get paid. So um, I moved in with Josh and I became a couple, which we are no longer, but we're best friends, which is way better. Um, but I moved in with him and we just didn't pay the mortgage. Um, I, don't, I don't know why they didn't turn off the electricity because I don't remember Josh ever really paying the electricity for either. So we didn't pay bills, um, not by principle. I mean, I think six months later, um, Josh started paying some things off. So, you know, we just we just juggled and then we, we ate from the shop. And uh, in terms of how did we fund the actual shop opening, we had ran Scotland Ski and Snowboard Show for two years. The first year, it almost bankrupted us. 
Um, so the Monday after the first one, I was phoning around the Citizens Advice Bureau asking, like, hypothetically, uh, if maybe we were to go <laughs> declare bankruptcy, what does that do to one's life? Um, and then we, we just got by, like, just got by that year planning the second ski show. We were like, well, the cash flow was crap. We've not made any money uh, at all to survive for the year. But if we can just survive, then we can build on the ski show because the exhibitors were really happy, the people who paid to come and take part. Um, they were thrilled because there weren't many exhibitors. <laughs> so they had a closed audience and a, and a good monopoly of that audience. So um, people were saying good things about it. And from that, we built the second ski show, which was successful and did make 30 grand. And as soon as we'd proven that it could make profit, but the plan was, you know, that we would keep doing the ski show, we'd keep doing the business awards, like that was, you know, we were running an events company by this point sort of together. Uh, with Josh leading, but me kind of doing everything and then telling him when he was being an idiot. Um, and so, yeah, by the time it came to open, by the time we decided to open the first Social Bites shop, we just said, let's sell that event that makes profit, let's keep the business awards because that's not for profit, and that's potentially an amazing platform that we've accidentally created to build a company because we can basically stand in front of all of, you know, the richest people in business in Scotland and say, um, can we have some money, please? <laughs> and we'll keep doing really good things for the homeless community, we promise. I mean, there's so many other things I could tell you about how we funded it, but I don't know when to stop talking. <laughs> um, a key takeaway there is stop paying your bills. Stop paying your bills and just, uh, you know, don't vote. And uh, No, don't do any of those things. <laughs> Definitely vote, even when you're not paying your bills. Okay, anyone else have a question? I mean, I'm in so much debt, I should. <laughs> I feel like I should really make that clear. Like, Josh's credit rating is, uh, I mean, I hope he'll be okay getting a mortgage one day when he comes to do it himself. I'll be better because it wasn't my name on that mortgage. But um, I had an O2 uh, SIM card with a contract, and I didn't pay my bill. And then, you know, eventually when you don't pay, you guys are students, you probably know when you don't pay your bill for long enough, they just cut you off. You can't use it anymore, which seems very unfair to me. And um, <laughs> I decided that if I just threw that SIM card away and went into EE and got a different SIM card, which of course they'll give you because these companies want to give you, you know, credit and contracts and all of these things, um, that that SIM card is just gone now. <laughs> it turns out that that SIM card, just like the bill just doubled, like while they were trying to double and then it doubled again and doubled again while they're trying to find me. So what was probably like a 50 quid phone bill has been about a grand that I've been paying off 100 pounds a month. Uh, for the last however long, and that finishes August this year. Um, so I should definitely say don't necessarily take that advice, but also, <laughs> you hear that sort of thing quite a lot of people that businesses just don't pay shit, and that's how you get it done. It's not a great way to go about things, but it's, yeah. yeah. Anyone got another question? Yeah? So, I'm not really sure exactly what kind of By this specific direction, can you be more specific about what you mean by this specific direction? <laughs> Why did you do social life? Oh, okay. Um, so yeah, do you want me to tell you a little bit about one of the, um, like a couple of the businesses that we saw over there as well, that we're kind of... Yeah, why not? Okay, so the one I like talking about is, so there's two, Muhammad Yunus defines social business as two different types. So there's one type where the business itself um, exists to achieve a social objective. So any profits made by that business get plowed back into the business to expand it and reach more people. Um, so a good um, example of that that we saw in Bangladesh was a, a company called Grameen Danone. So Grameen is the name of Muhammad Yunus's social business umbrella. He has he started like over 50 social businesses in Bangladesh. He doesn't own a share in a single one of them. They're all owned by the people, for the people, by the people. Um, so Grameen is his umbrella, and Danone is like, you guys know Danone, like the yoga company Danone. Like, mm, Danone. yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so they join up and they, they realized that malnutrition in children was a massive problem in Bangladesh. And um, so they decided to make a yogurt that was fortified with all the nutrients that a child needs to survive for one day. And they decided to make that yogurt um, and sell it for very, very cheap, about a penny a cup. Um, or they kind of come like froobs. 
Um, so they could sell these yogurts to parents that had no money. Um, and if they just gave nothing else other than this yogurt to their children um, every day for six months, the child is restored to full health. So that company is, by existing, achieving a social objective. So if that company makes any money, which last I checked five years ago, it was not. <laughs> um, but if it does, then it gets plowed back into the business to expand it and reach other areas that need it. So that's business, social business type one, and social business type two is any business, any Tom, Dick and Harry, just um, giving its profits to charity, so taking the greed out of um, business. So you pay yourself a salary, you never pay yourself more than seven times the lowest income paid out by the company, that's how Mohammed Yunus defines taking greed out of that. And um, so yeah, there were these two different types of social business, so those are the kind of things that we saw firsthand. And when we bought, we bought like um, 200 of these frubs and we were leaving the hotel in Dhaka one day. Like, it wasn't like we, we weren't like staying in hotels when we were out in rural Bangladesh. We were staying like on floors and things. But the one hotel we did stay in in Dhaka, the capital of Bangladesh, whenever we left the hotel with these fruits, like just get surrounded by these kids like snatching fruit. These they're not fruits, <laughs> but they look like fruits. Um, snatching these yogurts off of you, and like parents are just desperate for these things because they know it's going to keep their children alive. So that was for us like. One of the things that were like, wow, this is incredible. You can use business as like a tool to propel society forward in a better way rather than just for personal greed. Um, and in terms of why did we do Social Bite, we, because we were the events company, we had an office in Edinburgh, in central Edinburgh, and, um, and we would go for lunch every day because that was the only time we got out of the office. And we were just like a little bit uninspired by the selection. Pret was Pret's always really good. Um, a little bit expensive for us at the time because we were just starting out in business and like I say we had like no money um, but yeah we were kind of we also we wanted to start a business that was going to be a social business and be quite quick to get off the ground we didn't want to have to go and like learn how to do something that was going to be really complex um, so we just thought make food and sell food make food that tastes good and sell it at a reasonable price that seemed in our head at the time, we thought that's so simple. We can make that. We started making sandwiches and um, doing a trolley service where Josh Josh managed to get this van that was a. Uh, it was just a normal van, but it had been converted into a refrigerated van, and it was very dodgy, and it was half black, half white, and it was like as if it had been glued together in the middle, um, and we had this trolley, and we would get up at five in the morning and start making sandwiches, and we would drive around Edinburgh, Josh would, Josh would drop me and my friend Lucy, uh, who was doing the business with us initially, he'd drop us off on the curb and we would just go knock on office doors and go in and try and sell sandwiches. So we just thought it was going to be really easy and quick to get going because it was just something you could make food and sell it. Um, and we were initially we were just going to give the profits to charity because we were coming back from Bangladesh where poverty is raw. And we were thinking, well, it's not really like that in Scotland, so, you know, I guess we'll just give the profits to charity because it's not like we can come up with a yoghurt that's going to provide food for a malnourished child because, touch wood, that's not a problem that we so much have in Scotland. Um, so, yeah, it seemed like the simplest way to go. And, um, and then it was only once we opened and we started trading that we realised that there was a guy selling the big issue right outside and that he could have a job and that we could be giving food to homeless people and that there was so much more we could do with it than just giving the profits to charity. So. I was, that's answered one of my questions because I was wondering where your, your passion for homelessness had come from mm. because you could have gone in lots of different directions with that. You could have chosen different charities and different um, client groups to work with. So For me, I feel like... Um, I have realised, like, this is the belief I've held for a few years, but I have realised lately how naive this belief is. But it was my belief that um, homelessness is the biggest issue for our country because... Um, yeah, no, I'm going to go ahead and say I still do feel like that because I feel like if you don't even have a roof over your head, how are you going to fix anything else? So, yes, there's cancer and there's, you know, all of these horrible things and these amazing charities that exist, but there are people on the street with cancer and we homed one of them uh, in December, um, housed one of them. So I feel like, you know, every other problem in life is a lot more difficult when you don't have access to running water, when you don't have access to clean clothing, to warmth, to shelter, to safety, to um, security and feeling part of a community and feeling respected by other individuals rather than walked past while you sit on the floor and you're in filth with nothing, asking for spare change. So I feel like, 
for us coming back from Bangladesh, again, it's that kind of, I, I'm sure other charity leaders would say that's a very naive <laughs> point of view and they would be right, but that's just my experience of life has been being around poverty in Bangladesh and from the drive from the airport to the hotel in Dhaka, having, you know, traffic in Bangladesh. If any of you have ever been traveling, you'll know what I'm talking about, like sort of Vietnam, Bangladesh, India, the, the traffic systems in places like this, like there is no system. There's traffic lights. I don't know why there's traffic lights. Nobody pays attention to any of them. Um, they just beep and move. <laughs> so we were sort of stuck in traffic on that drive in and um, and a guy, a guy who had one eye and uh, was like, had like a rag around his um, penis. Um, and he came up and, and the door, the window was a little bit cracked on Josh's side and he was putting his hands over the window and then gesturing to us that he needed food like this. And I realized immediately, well, first of all, I got back to the hotel and cried. I think thinking about it makes me go. But I, I just realized like, wow, like we have no idea how we live in the UK. We have no idea that actually the majority of the planet is living like that. More people live like that than live like we do. And I really like was hit by it. Um, and so for us, it, it felt like in Scotland, the closest thing to that kind of desperation is homelessness. So it's naturally grown. Like at the beginning, it was like, this is a nice thing to do for a person who needs it. And over the years, it's become something that I am like passionate about and, and like angry about um, in a way that motivates me and hopefully is used energetically the right way. <coughs> And it is so stark for all of us. I mean, just walking walking around the streets in Glasgow, it's there everywhere, isn't it? Um, and okay. Any any other questions? I'd like to ask Alice. Josh your partner, we must Sure. Yeah. So Josh Josh is my business partner. Once was romantic partner, but I booted him. <laughs> no, well, I did, but we we did. Um, we're like best pals now. Uh, we run the company together. I was with him this morning, and we still drive each other mental in all the same ways. But we're like, just we get on now is the difference. As a romantic pair, we didn't get on so well. <laughs> um, Alice, you know, um, like three or four. Yeah. That's actually, so this is like, when you asked about how we funded it, there's like so many different things I could tell you about. So um, I guess what I'm gonna do before I answer that question is I'll explain a bit about like how the business is set up. So initially we set up a social business, we registered a limited company with Companies House and we traded as a limited company. Um, but then as I say, we started employing homeless people and feeding homeless people um, sort of along the journey. Um, so then we started realizing we were feeding homeless people every day with the limited company's money, um, which was a nightmare and meant that, I mean, as if it's, it's hard to make money selling, if you're going to go into business, maybe don't go into like cafes and stuff unless you've got the capital to do a lot at once because selling low ticket items, you just, it, you really struggle to make any money when you're making like 30p every time someone walks in the, in the shop. Um, so... Um, so yeah, so the limited company couldn't pay for the charitable work we were doing and because we were hiring, um, at the time, we say formally homeless now because it's people who are like in temporary accommodation or waiting to be housed or people that are coming from, yeah, the, more those backgrounds, whereas we were before, we were literally hiring guys living on the street and then I had two of them come and live with me because I kept turning up smelling and I was like, you need to shower, so come and live with me. Um, so when we started doing all this charitable stuff, we realized we should register a charity. So now what we have is the Social Bite Fund, which is the charitable body, and that sits um, at the top. And the, char the Social Bite Fund owns the limited business. So um, the It Is On campaign, which for anyone that isn't aware, every Christmas we run a thing, um, buy, buy a meal for a homeless guy, and we'll, we open on... We started by just opening on Christmas Day in the Rose Street shop in Edinburgh. Then we started opening, the following year we opened uh, on Christmas Day in every city, and now we open on Christmas Eve and Christmas Day in every city. Um, so what we do with this on is we, people bid, uh, people, sorry, pay five pounds for a, a meal for a homeless person to have Christmas dinner. But what we did is the first year we expected maybe a few thousand people to, to buy a meal, and that that would cover the Christmas Day that Josh and I were just, we just decided we'd rock up and open the shop and see if people turned up, and then a lot of people turned up. Um, 
And then we thought any money left, any of the money left over can pay for the food we're giving away um, for the first few months into next year, maybe January, February, that'd be nice. And so I think we were expecting to sell like maybe 5,000 and then 32,000 people bought them and it went and we were like, what? Um, so now that, so that has become so huge now that that pays for us. That's why we expanded the service last year. We opened on Christmas Eve and Christmas day in every city, but we now feed the homeless community no homeless person in Edinburgh, Glasgow or Aberdeen that comes into Social Bite Shop is ever denied food. We just constantly give food out to them and that pays for it for the whole year. I think it just about pays for it for the whole year and then it's topped up by the pay it forward service, which means that that, that last maybe couple of months that it wouldn't quite cover, it ends up covering. So. Great. Does that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. So it is on is a big part of the charitable thing that we do, in short. That's so interesting. So when we did, did you hear that question? Did anyone hear that? She said, "Is there any abuse of the system?" Yeah. So that's really interesting. And when we first started doing this pay it forward service, um, before even it is on came into the picture, uh, we had customers sometimes asking us, "But like, but how do you know if someone's homeless?" Um, the answer we always give is that if someone wants to pretend to be homeless to get free food, we'll give them free food. Um, how desperate is that person's life that they're pretending to be homeless to get free food? Uh, also, they usually don't come in wearing like suit and tie, <laughs> so you can kind of tell. Yeah, there were instances in Tor Bay recently where they seem to get all these people sitting on the street corners and just sort of yeah, so going over the evening. This is good. This is giving me a great opportunity to rant about something. Um, it's a really good question. Um, so people, yeah, we had that a lot. Like a lot of the guys that were working with us, because obviously we were employing guys that were at the time living on the street or selling the big issue. And so they knew, like, the guys on the street, they knew who was and who, who wasn't homeless. And they would come in for the suspended, we used to call it the suspended service, because it's like you suspend an item, but we now call it pay it forward, because people understand that a bit better. So they'd come in for the pay it forward service, and, um, and some of the guys were, they're not fucking homeless, I've seen them, they go home every night, and like, oh, all right for them. What I've discovered over the years is like becoming more educated to like this issue and with the housing first stuff, which I'm hoping someone's gonna ask something about housing first in a minute. Um, what I've discovered is that, so, so do you guys understand what, temp, does any, do you guys know what temporary accommodation is? Do you guys understand how that works? So our council has a responsibility to house any UK citizen who declares, who, who presents himself as homeless, um, which is great. But what that really means is that these temporary accommodation um, and B, they're B&Bs, but there's no <coughs> breakfast involved and some of the guys have told me that like sometimes there's no bed involved. It's like a room that you're booted into there's damp, there's leaks from the ceiling, um, or hostels. And when I say hostels, I don't mean the kind of hostels that we go and stay in as travellers because they don't actually allow homeless people in. I know because I've tried to actually house guys that I found on the street that night when it was particularly cold in a hostel in Edinburgh and I was told we don't take homeless people here, we only take travellers here. So when you hear hostel or when you hear B&B, that is temporary accommodation and temporary accommodation is actually run by dodgy landlords who own buildings who have not been in that building for 20 or 30 years and don't take care of the property and as such all of our most vulnerable population are shoved in this place at night you're not allowed in till 10 p.m you're not allowed out till 8 a.m um and that's you that and there's 11,000 families in scotland in temporary accommodation right now who don't know where they're staying from one night to the next and taking all of their worldly possessions out with them every day so the other part, so that's temporary accommodation. Um, it's like something I'm really passionate about. It's awful. Um, and the other part of that is that, yeah, there are some social housing that is given to people who then come and like beg on the street. Um, again, the only thing I would say is that, like, cause the people I've met in my line of work the last six years um, who are begging or who we, we run social suppers which is an event where we shut the shop at three and then we reopen at four o'clock especially for the homeless community to come in sit down they get waited on like normal people um, and there's also charity partners as well as our support workers who are present in those evenings so if anybody is in a place that they want to progress out of homelessness which a lot of people aren't ready for that um, in the position that they're in but if anybody is ready for that step, they can speak to a support worker about, you know, getting some drug addiction therapy or, or how to get clean or what services might be available to them, if they could be employed by Social Bite, all of these sort of things. But also it just provides food for anybody who just wants to come and get food. 
So what we see on the social staffers' evenings is that um, a lot of uh, the homeless guys that come in do have, they stay in, in social housing on the outskirts of Edinburgh and they, they come into town for this. But what you find out about these people, the more you get to know them, is that they're, they're not capable of working because they have severe mental health issues or, or addiction issues, um, or they just exhibit really antisocial behavior that people don't want to be around, um, or they maybe don't speak the language. The guys I'm thinking of in particular, just they're really lovely people, but they, they would ju they're just completely unemployable. No one would have them in their business in their right mind, which is the sad fact of it. So they don't have access to income other than what they can get from the council. But then what you find with a lot of the guys is they don't know how to access their income because they don't know how to read or write or fill out forms. Um, and then you have this issue where they're staying in a social house somewhere on the outskirts of Edinburgh, but they have no running water, they have no electricity, it's a shell. Um, and a lot of these areas I'm thinking about, like Sight Hill in Edinburgh, I don't know Glasgow that well if I'm honest, but when I think about those areas in Edinburgh, they're places where I know people who work for the council, support workers who work for the council, have gone out to these estates in these areas to go and offer support and check that they're okay, but they get greeted with a knife because people are afraid that they're turning up for bills. And so because of that antisocial behaviour, they just stop going out there. And as a result, it becomes these completely abandoned areas of society where you start having these schemes build up. And then those areas breed young pregnancies and more people who come in line with, with lack of employability and lack of opportunities. And I heard the, um, the CEO of Crisis the other day said that we've not got a crisis of poverty, we've got a crisis of a poverty of ambition. And it's because these people are growing up in these environments where their parents and their parents' parents have never had any ambition, never had any reason to believe that lives were going to change, or that they were worth something, or that they could contribute something. So yeah, some of these people that you see begging, they have houses, but the question I ask people to think about is, what kind of life do they have? Why are they begging on the street? Wouldn't they rather be working in a warm room? Even minimum wage has got to be better than what you make begging on the streets. I don't know. And you've seen some quite amazing stories, haven't you? I mean, I've, I've watched one of the videos on, on your website, and you, you can see where people are, have reached to now because you've been able to provide these basic yeah. Um, needs. Yeah, absolutely. We have guys who have... Um, there's one guy, I usually I used to use his name, but I'm not going to use his name anymore. But it's a shame because when you use someone's name, I feel like it's more real to a person. But this guy, one of the guys who lived with me um, for a little bit, one of the first guys we employed, um, I did my TED talk on him, so you can actually go and like see that if you want to. But the life that he had, the way that he ended up homeless was that he, um, by the age of five, he was found by social work, uh, locked in a cupboard, um, and he was put into social care, which is great because he had parents who were locking him, him in cupboards when they couldn't be bothered with him for, for days at a time, I should mention, without food or water or so much as a bucket. Um, so, yeah, it was good that he was put in care at that point, but what also happened was that he was separated from his siblings. So he was taken out of the family home, away from anybody that might have provided some kind of support system to him, and he was put into foster care and obviously immediately becomes a very difficult child, um, you know, swearing at anybody that tries to give him help and um, that kind of like weird smelly kid at school that everyone kind of has like one or two of those people in school I think who no one really knows why a guidance counsellor follows them around sometimes and like escorts them from room to room but we used to have kids like that and uh, or I remember one kid in particular in my school and I grew up in the highlands of Scotland and there was only a couple hundred kids in my school so um, yeah I remember one kid who had all of that support and all that work and I remember learning that this guy who was working with us was one of those kids who had all of this special help but unfortunately was kicking back at all of that help because all he'd ever known was being abandoned and uh, so by the age of 15 he, he left the foster home, he left school and um, by the age of 17 he was arrested and put into juvie as they call it, put into prison, uh, youth prison for assault, which is no surprise because as soon as he left the foster home and he left the schooling system at 15, he was on the streets and didn't have any friends or any family, nobody would take him in. So um, the first lesson he learned on the street that night was, you better have a knife on you because you're going to have to take care of yourself out here. Um, so of course he's in prison by, eight, by 17 for assault and by 19 he spat back out by the system with nobody, no prospects, now he's got a criminal record. Um, we, we met him at 21 selling the big issue, sleeping under a bridge. So that's the lifestyle that these people grow out of, and that's the kind of environment that these people who have houses grow up in, um, typically. Yeah. 
That's my bad. Education and education. Do we have any Yeah, it's much lower, um, which is a problem, but it's also rep representative of the community. So 40% of Scotland's homelessness uh, is single men. And then you have like another, we're testing my statistics now, I'd have to check it, but you've got, probably got about another 30% which are couples. So that's men and women. And then you've probably got 10% of that which are single women, and then 10% of that which are probably seven, another 7% is probably single women with children, and then you've probably got 3% which is um, unidentifiable. Last time I checked the statistics, but I say guys because uh, it's a bad anti-feminist thing that I need to get out of doing because I am a feminist. Um, I use guys generally, but yeah, there are um, there is two women working with us right now for homelessness that I can think of off the top of my head. Uh, oh wait, no, that's three. Three out of about. Homeless, out of about 25 homeless guys, people, I reckon, three of them are women. But then we have about another 10 people on top of that who aren't actually homeless. But So like one guy who works in one of our shops in Edinburgh came to us in the first year of business and just his mum had heard that there was this social business that had opened up and she brought him in when he was like maybe 17. And she said, my son is heavily autistic and he's never going to be employable anywhere, but he can... He's very good at, if you show him how to do something, he will do that again, exactly as you want it. Um, so we took him in and he still works with us. And then we have um, a, another young man out at our central production kitchen who um, is deaf without speech. Deaf mute is not the politically correct term anymore, just in case anyone was wondering. Deaf without speech. Um, and he's, he's great. Um, he's, a, he's actually a really big character. Um, so there's a lot of other people or people fleeing domestic abuse. So, so there's... A few, there's a, a demographic that we don't really talk about much because we protect their identities, but there's like another 10 or 20 odd people that work with us that actually come from uh, other vulnerable areas, but homelessness is like the main focus because it breeds all of those antisocial problems. Yeah, so you guys are working with women in rural Malawi to set up social businesses. This is for them to set up social businesses. Are you, are you, and I assume, so you're using microfinance? Uh, no, it's mostly like kind of self generated It's like a national charity to get some funding. Okay. I would say um, the first thing I think is because t for me, microfinance, as soon as I found it, I was like, this is the tool to end world poverty. Um, just purely because like, there's no point in waiting for government to act in those areas, it's so corrupt. And um, so if there's any way you can dip into microfinance to start funding these things more, then that's one way of doing that. Online campaigns are great for that. But reaching out to women that you're working with to maybe like, if they need some capital to start up with that maybe your charity can't fulfill, encouraging them to go on, is it uh, Kiva? What's the website called that's for setting up microfinance? Google it. Google knows everything. Um, so yeah, that's another way if you're looking for funding. Have you been out there yet? Yeah. Okay, so I think the main advice I'd say is like going out there and speaking to them and seeing like what, because the problems you end up coming up against, which you'll probably know having been out there, is stuff you would just never think about. Like we got out there and they were like, it's irrigation. If we could irrigate our land, we'd be fine. And I was like, well, never knew that. That's Africa's problem, like obviously. But um it was really one of those things that like their family and everything would be fine. And so they, they started creating these little devices, like these little hoses that they would line throughout the field that would then, they designed them so they just started stabbing holes in them and, and connecting other hoses that, that it would irrigate the land more efficiently. So, and then the, yeah, they did all sorts of different like walking machines that you could walk on it and it would pump water out all over the field. So we, I started to understand like the basic issues that they were the basic issues are coming up against are really practical easy to solve issues if you've got some money and some brain power to apply to it so i would say just spending time out there speaking to them but if you've done that maybe that's not helpful advice i don't know um catch me yeah, drop me an email or something we can chat for hours about it okay 
Okay, another question. What are the challenges of? Of uh, you know, like social bites and then choose one yeah. of the contexts, right? That's interesting. I was wondering, like, the situation that you described about temporary accommodation, yeah. uh, what inspired that? So, yeah, so temporary accommodation has inspired a lot. Um, I'd say what the, the thing has been, like, working with these people, and, like, some of the guys would say, like, some of the homeless people would say, Oh, I'm gonna go stay at my B and B tonight, and I started getting a bit curious. A couple years and going, what B and B like sort of doesn't sound that bad, really, does it? Um, so once I started like hearing people, they're like, oh wait, wait, wait a second, there's no bed and there's no breakfast involved. I was like, what? Why is it called B and B? Like, I don't know. That's what the council calls it. it. Just sounds better, I suppose. So starting to learn all of this stuff and starting to really spend my time around these people and seeing the realities of where they were staying was an inspiration, but it wasn't the direct inspiration to the village. The village was just something where we felt like we started a business where we were gonna give the profits away. Then we naturally decided to employ homeless people. Then we naturally decided to give food to homeless people. So it just felt like the next step on. We were just like, we, just, we need to keep doing stuff and using our sort of like entrepreneurial um, mind, minds to tackle these big problems. So why don't we just start helping them? <laughs> it just seemed like the next step. So the village idea was born and um, the idea was, yeah, that it was going to be, you know, this place in Granton, which is out by the sea in Edinburgh. Um, and that was an interesting idea and it's still going to be a really valuable thing and it opens any day now. Our deputy chief executive, Jane, who's incredible, is just like running around like headless chicken getting that all set up. I haven't even, I haven't seen it since the very early stages, so it's going to look completely different when I go and see it. But no, if I'm honest, what happened was it felt like the next step and then we came out with this thing of like, we're going to put this village together and we're going to house people too. Um, but there's only 20 spaces out there and it's for a 15 month period at a time as a sort of solution to, I suppose, temporary accommodation, yeah, with the view to put them in permanent housing at the end of that tenure. But um, the really interesting thing that's happening with Social Bite right now is this housing first stuff, which I'll, I'll wait and answer that stuff in another question, but because um, it's a long thing. But uh, how temporary accommodation is what inspires me to understand housing first as the most important way forward for homelessness in Scotland. So it still educates a lot of what we've done, but what I see the village doing is providing a really good safe place where it is slightly removed from society um, for people who uh, need a different level and like a community integration type of support where they need to live with people who are also trying to improve their lives. And what I see it as being one day is maybe a place for, it's not this right now, but I see it one day being a, like a rehab place. So homeless people who are struggling with addiction is then have an opportunity to go and stay in a nice warm environment where support lives on site 24 seven. And they're with other people who come from homelessness who are trying to get clean. Um, because obviously like one thing everyone sort of knows about getting sober and rehab is that you need to be taken away from the environment in which you're in with all of your regular habits and things. So. Um, but yeah, the village is, is going to be an amazing project, but it's also, uh, it was, in my eyes, it was sort of a stepping stone to finding this really, like, amazing Housing First strategy. Can I just ask, um, so, uh, so much of what you have done and achieved, I think, is as a result of your passion and vision. But for students here who've maybe got an idea, want to, to become social entrepreneurs, what do you think are the key skills, traits, beyond passion and vision that, mm. that would help them with this? Mm, that's a good question. Um, I always struggle with this question a little bit because I want to. I'm going to be real with you rather than saying all the typical things. Um, I think you have to, like, when I think about like social bite success, like Josh and I have been like a brilliant yin and yang to each other. Um, Josh is very entrepreneurial like to the point of irritation for a lot of people. Like you guys know, like you guys kind of ever do any research on like Steve Jobs kind of characters, like truly amazing men, people who are just like, it has to be that way. 
why wouldn't the button be round rather than a square? Round is nicer to look at. No, Steve Jobs, it doesn't work that way. That's not how computers work. It is now. Like, that forward vision is incredible, and I think Josh has that. But what Steve Jobs and Josh also have in common is that they drive people mental, and that they're actually really difficult, not necessarily Josh, but that kind of character is really difficult to be around, and people don't like working for that kind of a character because they're unreasonable and they ask for impossible things um, for not much money and all of your time. Um, so actually, you know, and actually Josh is still a little bit like this sometimes. Jane, our deputy chief executive, was saying to the other day that she's struggling to nail down this meeting um, for all the people from all the different charities to come together and, and work out the, the system for the village. And that Josh was on the phone to going, I just don't understand why they won't meet me on a Sunday. What is wrong with them? Like, they're not free on a Sunday. And Jane was like, no, because that's not reasonable, is it, Josh? Because <laughs> uh, people have like families and lives and stuff, and people's lives don't actually resolve, revolve around what you want to do. <laughs> but Josh doesn't understand that, because Josh is like, I need this thing done. I've got an hour free on Sunday. Why wouldn't, you know? So I think it is, it's this unreasonable inability to hear no when you want to do something, that entrepreneurial character. Um, but then I think what worked really well for us was that I was I, on the other end of that, I was raised, like my mom's a counselor. So I was raised by like a therapist who's like, mm, and how do you feel about that? Like all of the time. So I've grown up to be quite a, like, I love to like hug the homeless guys and get to know their stories and work with the staff. And when the staff are like, you know, at the end of it, and they're like, I just can't come in on Saturday. I've worked five days, I'm knackered. Like, I've got this on, I've got that. I, would, I hear their stories like, oh, that's really, like, that can't be. Um, we've got to change that. So you've kind of got, like, those completely opposing characters. And I'm quite, I'm very creative, but I can't take credit for Josh's entrepreneurial spirit. But Josh can't take credit for my ability to, like, keep people around beyond where they would have done if Josh would have been left his own devices. Um, so I think like the combination of that was brilliant for Social Bite and really exhausting for Josh because he spent his whole life being like, just do what I want you to do, Alice, and me just being like, stop asking for me to do the impossible, Josh. So I think for us, if I'm speaking authentically from my experience, that has been my experience of what made it work so well. I think the, the passion came later for me. Like I say, we sort of, it was a cool idea. I grew up, think, I, Bob Geldof like, did Live 8 when I was 16. So I was watching that, like, this guy is a rock star. Like, I loved his aggressive sort of rock star personality that went along with this social conscience. So I loved all of that. But so the, the social bite thing really appealed. I wanted to build that with Josh. That took me so far. And then it was only, like, the following years of actually being around the guys that I started to think, this is really unfair. Why is our system that way? That doesn't make any sense. Do people know that the system is that way? Like. That came later for me, so passion, yes. Doing something that someone else, doing something that someone else either isn't doing already, or picking something that everyone else is doing because it is so successful and then doing it better than them. It's the usual stuff. You guys have read that stuff from textbooks. <coughs> I waffle. Did I tell any of you guys at the beginning that I waffle? <laughs> Very interesting. Cut, cut me off if it's boring, please. Okay, um, we've just got time for one or two more questions, so um, you've had a question, I think, haven't you? So I'll go to the chair on that, yeah. <coughs> so going back to the social enterprise, social business um, in Scotland, uh, what to you, in your opinion, uh, has made social bias stand out from all these social enterprises across Scotland? Because there are dozens of them. Yeah. And what do they need to do, or what are they doing wrong in comparison to you oh, to get right. to your state? So I don't know if anyone's doing anything wrong. <laughs> um, but I think what makes Social Bite stand out, so I think my honest answer to this is that the, the Scottish Business Awards was a twist of fate. Like that was an event before we ever knew anything about wanting to do Social Bite that existed. And we ended up, you know, the birth of Social Bite came from that first one and from traveling to Bangladesh to try and bring Mohammed Yunus over to be the keynote speaker. So. That event was then there as this entirely for profit thing that we kept running alongside Social Bike for the first few years. So we would put together these amazing videos like the one that you saw. And I always joke that they're like our emotionally manipulative videos <laughs> because there's like, you know, some of the homeless guys from the beginning telling their stories about why they are here and what they are doing and what they've done with their experience of Social Bike. 
but they're really like emotive stories and when you put the right music over the top of these viral videos like we go, oh, and kind of get them all going um so i think um having well eh, no i don't agree so the scottish business wars allowed us this platform to expand because we would play these videos and then go please put your hand in your pocket richest people in scotland and give us your money to open more stores so that's how we expanded so immediately, and um, the fact is as well that we have a high street location. I think you could argue that's marketing. Um, but yeah, it's like you guys will be familiar probably with shops like, uh, with charities like Shelter, uh, Cancer Research UK. Like these are the big charities that you kind of know of as being like established charities. And I guarantee you it's because in your subconscious, they are on the high street. You walk past them so you're aware of them and it seems like they're a game player, they're a competitor in a very real way. Um, so I think Social Byte has that presence on the high street, which came from the expansion, which came from the business awards. Um, and I think and then on top of that, we have this amazing entrepreneurial spirit. Um, and we bought ourselves a lot of credibility with people like, for example, George Clooney, he came to speak at the business awards, but we tied into his contract that he had to come and visit the Social Byte store and have pictures with some of the homeless staff. And as such, the press report, George Clooney stopped by Social Byte. Like as if he like heard about Social Bite in LA and had to come over and like visit us and, and shed a light on this issue. Um, and then Leonardo DiCaprio came the following year um, for the Business Awards again, but same thing. Um, and then off the back of that, a couple of weeks ago, Prince Harry and Meghan Markle just genuinely got in touch and said, we're in Edinburgh, we'd like to come and visit what you're doing. So I think we've managed to get a lot of credibility in all of those areas. And we just dream really big. So like last year we did sleep in the park to raise millions of pounds for housing first. And we had like 8,000 people come together and sleep out like under Edinburgh Castle in a very, you know, in the bang center of Edinburgh. So we're, we're not afraid to be like quite ballsy and like um, kick up quite a fuss, which hasn't, you know, there were times that third sector didn't like receive us very well. Like when we came out with a village plan, we received like some negative press from like CEOs or like leaders of other charities that were like, you guys don't know anything about homelessness. You don't solve homelessness by putting a bunch of homeless people in the middle of nowhere. They need to be integrated into society. They need to learn how to live amongst the community. That's what we need to be working on. And any research would tell you that. So that kind of gregarious attitude of social bite has at times ended up, you know, doing that for us. But then we react, responded to that as well. And we said, okay, let's commission a study to Harriet Watt University and ask them to find out what is the cause of homelessness, what is the solution to homelessness. And that's how we found out about Housing First. And now we've got like another level of credibility where, yeah, we've got the credibility from the public eye, but we also, in the third sector and now at government, we're being listened to just because we responded to that. Uh, so I think it's, yeah, it's just so much. It's, it's just being able to listen I think being able to listen to like other entities and listening means asking questions as well. Listening means like asking something like this morning we were this something this is my big thing this year is asking questions when I don't know about something. So when I don't understand a housing like a principle in housing first, which is this big thing we're doing at the moment, I ask about it rather than not saying anything because I think people think I should already know the answer to that. I'm now just asking the dumb questions. And this morning we were looking at new locations for another potential social bite shop in Glasgow. And we're walking around with this property guy. And he's like, yeah, because the restaurant requirement sector has really decreased lately. And so you guys are actually at a really good time. And I was like, and the, I was with two of the guy, it was with Josh and a board member. And they're like, hmm, that's really interesting. And I was like, sorry, what do you mean by the restaurant's requirement sector is really decreasing right now? What requirements, their requirements for what? And then I had that explained to me. and and. I think it's listening and asking questions when you don't understand what you're listening to so that you can get the whole picture and then act upon that. I think that's vital. Great. Well, Alice, that's been absolutely fascinating and I'm really sorry it's coming to an end. Uh, we've, we've, got, we've got to stop now. We've got to um, wind up. But um, I just think, well, you've got the housing first thing in at the end there. So that was, I was wondering, I was starting to think, how can we bring in housing first? Because I know you wanted to talk about it. Um, but I think, you know, for us working in careers, we see a lot of students who say they want to make a difference. They say, I don't really know what I want to do, but it's really important to me that I go out there and I make a difference and I give something back. And I think it's just been really inspiring to hear from somebody uh, like Alice who has gone and done that um, and has had such a big, a big impact. So 
I'm sure you've all really appreciated that as much as I have. It's been a real privilege to hear your story. So thank you very Thanks much for so coming. Much. Cheers. Thank you.